Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, um, welcome everyone to today's webinar. We, uh, we have Ivan Galpar Soro from ASTI on who's gonna be speaking about a new tool for assessing the environmental impacts of wave energy projects. And introduce myself, um, my name is Sarah Carr. I am the uh, chief knowledge broker for OCTO, which is Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, and we, this is part of our regular webinar series. We've hosted one to three webinars a, a month dating back to 2006. And so we're very glad to have Eben with us today to continue uh, uh, our uh, tradition of, of excellent webinars on cutting edge topics in marine conservation and management. Um, before I turn it over to Eben, I wanted to let everyone know, so we'll have um, a formal presentation by Eben, and then we will uh, have a Q&A session. If you want to send in questions before the end, feel free to send in questions at any point. You can send the questions either by um, putting them into the question panel of your user interface or by typing them into the chat. Um, with the chat, you have the option of letting everyone on the webinar see the question or comment, um, or just sending it straight to even and I. Um, we just ask that if you are sharing anything in the chat, please keep it to the topic. Um, thank you very much. And even I'll turn it over to you now. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning. Uh, to the attendees and uh, thank you, Sarah, for inviting me to give uh, this talk. Um, so today my presentation deals with the uh, framework and uh, tool uh, that we developed for assessing the environmental impacts of wave energy projects. So the context is that uh, the present renewable energy is, uh, is a means to decarbonize and uh, to combat uh, climate change, but uh, within the renewable energy technologies, uh, there are, it will require the diversification and alternatives and uh, different technologies. So uh, nowadays, uh, marine renewable energies uh, could contribute uh, in, uh, in an important way to those uh, uh, targets. Uh, within the renewable uh, marine renewable energies, there are different uh, technologies and different resources, and uh, one of them is uh, the energy that could be produced or obtained from uh, waves. Uh, this is not uh, the most uh, developed uh, technology uh, nowadays uh, in comparison uh, with, uh, for example, uh, offshore uh, wind, but uh, there is a big potential of extracting uh, energy from waves. And there are some uh, estimations that it could reach to up, that there is a potential to reach uh, to a capacity over 300 uh, gigawatts from uh, wave and tidal energy converters by 2050, which could have uh, important um, impacts economically or uh, socioeconomically, uh, as well as, as I said, uh, to, uh, to the decarbonization and the, the climate change um, combat. So, uh, as I said, the technological development of wave energy converters is progressing fast, but at the same time, there are some techno non-technological barriers that could hinder the development of wave energy sector. And among them, there are, as we said, the early phase of development of those technologies. And at the same time, due to this uh, technological aspect also that uh, at present, they are considered as not being uh, economically um, in, um, 
I mean, they are considered not to be, they are considered to be uneconomical. Uh, that's from the technological side. Uh, on the other hand, if mm, wave farms are going to uh, be developed, it will uh, require space and uh, marine spatial planning or adoption of other measures to reduce uh, the potential competition and conflicts between wave energy industry and other marine sectors, such as uh, fisheries or marine traffic, etc. Uh, another uh, barrier that has been identified is the uh, consenting processes. Um, nowadays, they are length uh, and it incurs in a lot of uh, costs. And temporal costs are uncertainties and economic costs uh, because of the complexity and uh, at the moment the lack of uh, dedicated uh, legal frameworks. And also somehow uh, related to this, uh, the environmental risk and uncertainties regarding to the potential environmental impacts produced by wave energy converters. So, and this is uh, the, uh, the point and the topic in which we have developed our most uh, recent uh, work. So we have been working on the ecological risk assessment of wave energy converters. Uh, in general terms, the ecological risk assessment is defined as being a process to evaluate the likelihood or probability of adverse ecological effects that may occur as a result of exposure to one or more stressors related to human activities. So in this case, we are considering the wave the stressors or the pressures that could be produced by uh, wave energy converters. The ecological risk assessment goes through uh, different uh, steps. So initially, it's the identification of the potential risks based on the project characteristics and magnitude. So considering the type of device, uh, the size of the project, the amount of devices or the production capacity. And according to this, uh, there are different uh, likelihood of production of pressures or different intensity of pressures that in combination with the ecosystem uh, sensitivity to such pressure, uh, it could be transferred into uh, ecological risks. And this is where we have been working. Uh, based on that, and uh, based on the assessment of the ecological risks and the interpretation and the evaluation, the final aim of this process is the identification of hazards for the adoption of uh, mitigation measures to uh, reduce or avoid uh, such uh, environmental risks. So the final objective of the uh, ecological risk assessment is to uh, quantitatively or qualitatively determine the probability that an ecosystem indicator will reach or remain in an undesirable state. So for that, uh, uh, we considered the full ecosystem elements, uh, considering the, um, the um, ecosystem uh, functions or processes, uh, species, habitats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In order to frame all that ecosystem elements, uh, we have uh, based our uh, analysis on the list of pressures ecosystem elements and indicators of the European Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, this is the main uh, environmental legislation uh, in Europe, but as I said, it is uh, considering all uh, the ecosystem elements and uh, pressures that could be produced by human activity. So uh, it is, um, it's a framework that could be uh, implemented uh, elsewhere. So uh, the European Marine Strategy Framework Directive establishes uh, a list of 16 different pressure types, which are the stressors, and uh, 27 ecosystem elements, which are the receptors of uh, such pressures. So 
uh, dealing with the wave energy converters, uh, there are few experiences, mainly based on uh, testing sites, uh, which means that there are limited number of devices um, in operational mode on those uh, testing sites. And there are diverse uh, technologies at the moment. Uh, this means that there is a limited uh, amount of uh, data and, um, and uh, uh, scientific publications and databases um, in relation to these technologies. So uh, in our case, uh, we used an expert uh, consultation process in order to uh, assess the ecological risks that could be produced by uh, wave energy converters. So once we collected uh, all the information, we uh, obtained uh, more than 7,000 indicators of risks, which is the uh, calculated based on 16, it's a combination of the 16 pressures uh, on uh, with, the, um, uh, with the, the effects that could be produced um, in the 27 ecosystem elements for three different uh, wave energy converters technologies during the three life uh, cycle phases, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a huge amount of data. Uh, we obtained more than 400 indicators of sensitivity of ecosystem elements to pressures. So what we saw is that this is a huge amount of data. It's uh, quite difficult to manage and to query uh, the database and uh, to, to check uh, for that information. So uh, what we did at that stage, it was uh, the development of an online and free access web app tool for the assessment of ecological risks of the uh, wave energy projects. And the tool that we uh, developed is called uh, the WEC-ERA tool, which stands for uh, Wave Energy Converters uh, Ecological Risk Assessment. And now I will show you, I will, will go through a live demo of the tool. Okay, so um, uh, you can access to the tool using this link. And this is uh, what you get. There are some uh, conditions of the cookies policy, etc. general things. And uh, there is, uh, okay, you have to click there and you can directly enter into the tool. So, as I said, uh, the first uh, step in the ecological risk assessment is the definition of the characteristics and uh, the magnitude of the project. So for that, uh, the user is requested to fill in uh, these uh, fields of information. It's the number of devices, the occupied area uh, of the farm, the total installed production capacity, the project duration, sealed area per device, and the sealed total area. This is the only input from the user side uh, because then the tool guides the user through different steps, but this is the only input. And this is uh, requested to assess or to calculate the project magnitude. Uh, so for example, here the user can change the number of devices, or increase the number of devices, et cetera. So according to these parameters, the, uh, let's say the, the app of the software calculates a uh, different uh, magnitude of the project, okay? The second step is uh, the pressure assessment. As I said, uh, the user can select three different devices, the oscillating water column, the oscillating wave surge converter or wave turbine, we can go for the oscillating water column, for example, and then the life cycle phases, because at the end, we know that the pressures that could be produced during the installation or operational or the commissioning phases are going to be different or are expected to be different. So uh, we can check here, which would be, for example, in this case, the pressures of a oscillating water column during the operational phase. So uh, this plot uh, shows uh, the likelihood, the level, the total pressure, and the uh, uncertainty or 
the confidence level uh, of the pressures produced by this uh, technology during this uh, uh, life cycle phase, operational phase, and for the 16 types of pressures according to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So uh, you see that, for example, uh, some of the pressures are not going to, to happen. They are not expected to be produced by those devices. But in other cases, there is a maximum uh, likelihood of producing pressures such as input of noise, or input of uh, electromagnetic fields and some physical pressures like the extraction of energy or physical disturbance or physical loss um, on, on the seabed. Uh, this is regarding to the likelihood of the pressure and this is the level of the pressure and by combining both, we do have uh, this assessment of the total pressure that could be expected by uh, this device. And interesting, this is an interesting point here. This is the confidence level that was uh, provided by uh, the users, the experts in this case. So for example, it is uh, agreed here that it's uh, a potential pressure is uh, related to the inputs of uh, electromagnetic fields or noise. And at the same time, we see that the confidence level in this case is lower, uh, but for example, for physical disturbance or uh, destruction, so here the confidence level is higher. In a second stage, the user can also see which is the sensitivity of different ecosystem elements. Here you can see the 27 different ecosystem elements that are uh, listed in the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So. You can check here uh, mammals or fish, update. And here you can see the plot showing which is the sensitivity of each of these ecosystem uh, components to uh, those 16 types of pressures. So in the case of fish, uh, the, I mean, the sensitivity to, for example, noise or electromagnetic fields, input of uh, other uh, substances or physical loss of the substratum, etc. Uh, in relation to habitats, check here, for example, uh, this is a for example for seabed uh, or benthic habitats is this kind of uh, green. Uh, the main effects are related to physical uh, pressures, physical loss or physical disturbance. This is mainly related to the mooring systems of the wave energy converters. Or in the case of the pelagic habitats, it seems that the highest sensitivity is related to the input of organic matter, nutrients, or hydrological changes that in this case also could be produced by wave energy converters. And then uh, there is uh, a set of different indicators uh, of the ecosystem structure of functioning, or, uh, morphology of the seafloor, or let's say, let's check or organic carbon, I don't know. So the user can check, select, and visualize uh, different uh, sensitivity of all the ecosystem elements, or just check the full list of ecosystem elements and their sensitivity to each of those uh, pressures. Then another um, step of the tool is that the user can also see what is called the uh, impact chain. So for example, here, uh, the user can see uh, the different devices at a different uh, phase. So for example, here we were checking the what, uh, oscillating water column during the operational phase. So by just clicking on that device and that phase, the user can see which are the expected pressures and which, which would be the ecosystem elements that potentially uh, could be uh, affected by those pressures. Here, the, the size of the box also is related to the amount of links or the user can also check here, for example, input of organic matter. You, we see, for example, that 
it's uh, not a pressure that would be produced by those devices. Anyway, the, the, the tool provides that information, but it not, it's not going in the other uh, direction. Um, and that's it, uh, input of noise, all kinds of devices can produce uh, noise. And those are here, for example, you can see that the species or biological components of the ecosystem would be the ones that are more sensitive to uh, the input of, of noise. So finally, uh, the tool provides this matrix. So here you can see in, in, in the, the, let's say the, um, uh, in, in, in columns, uh, the 16 different pressures and in rows, the 27 ecosystem elements. So uh, the interesting thing of this is that uh, it gives for each uh, combination of ecosystem elements and pressure, it provides an indicator of the potential risk. Okay, so certain number of combinations are not possible to happen. They are not links, there is not this uh, impact chain, uh, there is no, no effect or there is no risk, but uh, for other combination, the user can easily see uh, which are the most uh, risk, uh, risky combination between the pressure and the ecosystem element. Uh, the user can, uh, let's say, uh, filter or order by pressure seen which would be the uh, ecosystem element, in this case, the mammals or the sound escape of the zone. And yeah, the elements that might be uh, affected or for example, here for physical loss, checking this, uh, the user can see that, for example, the seabed morphology or the depth or the benthic habitats would be the ecosystem elements that potentially would be more uh, sensitive to this pressure. The interesting point here is that um, managers or uh, scientists or the industry itself can check uh, if uh, in, within a, a project proposal, those ecosystem elements or these pressures are already considered within the proposal. If uh, in the location in which the project uh, is expected to be built to see if those ecosystem elements are uh, present. If uh, there is enough information, for example, on those ecosystem elements in order to reduce the potential uncertainties or the adoption of any measure to mitigate the potential uh, impacts of the project, etc., etc., etc. So it allows to highlight uh, which are the pressures or ecosystem elements in which, let's say, uh, it should be, uh, I mean, for those ecosystem elements for which uh, we should pay attention. And finally, the user can have or get this uh, summary table. Uh, in this case, it's a simplified version of the, of the previous table. So just with the list of pressures, the pressure level, pressure likelihood, the ecological sensitivity, the full ecological sensitivity to these pressures, the project magnitude that we have defined, and the uh, ecological risk uh, for, for, that, for that pressure. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, at this, each of those steps, the user can download the pictures or, I mean, can download different information at each of those steps. But an uh, interesting point here is that the user can download a full uh, report of, uh, of the assessment. Okay, the interesting thing here is that the user can check here uh, different uh, magnitude projects or can check here uh, the assessment uh, for the different life cycle phases of the project and uh, there are like different scenarios and the user can download uh, a full uh, description of the assessment. It takes the input values 
and uh, all the step by step, step by step, and all the all the all the assessment. Another interest. Uh, sorry, another uh, another interesting thing here is that sorry for this. The user here can also download the the matrix in a that it could be easily opened in an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, yeah, this is a, they are tabular data. So it's the, the same um, it's the same table, but uh, in tabular values. So the user can see this this data. So that's uh, the tool. Uh, another uh, important thing uh, to highlight is that uh, there is a paper that was published uh, recently, this last summer, with a detailed description of the expert consultation process. And, uh, and we describe all the analysis performed, all the assumptions, and how the tool has been developed. Why? Because at, this, because at the end, uh, as, as I mentioned, there is a huge amount of data. And um, we thought that it was not going to, to be easy to reach by uh, the target uh, audience or expected users. And, uh, and that's why we produced the tool. But we didn't want the tool to be a black box. Uh, so. Uh, all the information that was collected by uh, through the expert consultation process, all the uh, matrices and uh, all the data are uh, provided as uh, supplementary material on, on, on this paper. And, uh, and this is because it's what, what, I mean, we have some transparency and some validation of the work done uh, with this paper, but at the end, uh, the, the, the final users with different uh, technical uh, profiles or skills can access to the same information, but uh, through this interface that is the, the Wekera tool. Uh, we have some uh, indicators of how the tool is performing. Uh, it, it, uh, we have more than 400 uh, users uh, from, from August, when that is the date in which we launched the the tool, and uh, there are, we have uh, users at uh, more than uh, 30 uh, countries around the world. So now, uh, this is, uh, from our side, we are also working on, on, on different um, topics also, and another point, interesting point, as, as uh, I mentioned before, is the, uh, the link between uh, the wind farms or the expected growth of wind farms and uh, in the framework of the marine spatial planning or in the framework of not uh, having conflicts with other users or, uh, or identifying the areas in which the ecological risks are expected to be uh, the low, lowest. So for that, uh, we are also working on the, the development of decision support tools so in this case, uh, they are dedicated to site identification of more suitable areas for the development of and deploying of energy uh, production projects. So this is a conceptual um, model of uh, how uh, the different dimensions are interlinked. So today I have shown you the, the framework of the environmental risk assessment, but at the same time, we are developing uh, models to integrate also uh, the technical risk assessment or considering the energy resource, the good weather windows or periods uh, for the construction or maintenance of the wave farms, the distance to substations, distance to harbor, uh, seafloor type, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the socioeconomic risk assessment. As I said, in this case, we are approaching uh, that dimension, but by uh, analyzing the potential conflicts with other uh, maritime activities. Uh, we are classifying maritime activities into limiting or excluding. So for example, uh, where pipelines or cables are um, uh, 
uh, on the seafloor, uh, they are considered as being excluding for the establishment of uh, wave energy projects, but there are other activities uh, like, our, let's say, for example, fisheries, uh, which uh, are, to a certain extent would be um, limiting factors for the establishment of wave energy farms. And finally, uh, the idea again is to produce a, a suitability assessment by using uh, integrated information and that's much uh, simple or uh, uh, easy to, to, to check. So in this case, we are also developing uh, another tool, which is called uh, a BAPEM tool, which is an interface between complex models and the, the user. Uh, today, I'm not going to enter into this because this is a, a work in progress. Uh, but if you are interested, you can get access to the tool and uh, you can, it is free. Uh, the only thing is that you have to, to, to sign up, but uh, it is free and we have already uh, some uh, functions and some tools for the uh, identification of suitable areas for the development of uh, offshore wind farms and uh, wave energy farms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the kind of uh, outcomes that uh, we are producing uh, based on, as I said, the uh, assessment of ecological risks, which somehow we can identify uh, those areas in which uh, we identify that uh, ecological risks uh, might be uh, maybe a limiting factor for the development of wave energy converters, or at least in the areas in which um, additional uh, work and surveys should be conducted to, to get uh, a better information on the potential interactions between the wave energy converters and the ecological components. So, uh, the idea is that uh, these kind of approaches are not intended to question the expectations of offshore energy production as a source of clean and uh, re renewable energy. That's clear that uh, the marine and uh, offshore um, energy uh, will play a very relevant uh, role in the decarbonization. So that's, uh, that's a clear thing, but uh, what we are trying is to uh, provide and inform by providing a state of the art of scientific knowledge regarding to ecological consequences that the establishment or the expansion of uh, energy sector could cause at local or in some cases even at the regional scale, but for the adoption of measures or how to uh, reduce such risks uh, or mitigate uh, the potential environmental impacts of, uh, of this sector. But we should be also aware that the environmental impacts should be or must be, in fact, evaluated on project by project basis as these are site specific. So uh, you, you have noticed that, for example, we are working with uh, ecosystem elements, for example, mammals or birds. So the, the, the tools that we are uh, producing at this stage are not considering the potential impacts on a specific uh, species, uh, because of, depending on the ethology or uh, characteristics of the species, the potential impacts uh, of uh, wave energy uh, converters might be different. So this is a, a, a also an important thing to, to, to highlight uh, that uh, what we are uh, producing is a generic uh, tool uh, for an initial assessment of the potential risks, but in fact, uh, uh, the environmental impacts must be evaluated, uh, as I said, as project by project basis. So uh, our contribution uh, to this topic is to produce models and tools with a scientific basis that could be useful for our, all interested parties, managers, policymakers, industry, maritime sectors, or the general public. And in, it's very important also for us to make them free and publicly available. Uh, recommendations uh, to reduce the uncertainties on ecological risks based on 
data acquired uh, during the monitoring programs of uh, testing sites, uh, promote transparency and sharing of data and information from existing monitoring programs of operational farms, or at least on the uh, testing sites, in order to be used as transfer value for new projects and periodical updates because uh, at the end, uh, more projects are going to, to be uh, constructed. So uh, it is expected that more and more information is going to be produced, more empirical information is going to be available. So uh, our role here is to see or to define a strategy to integrate that uh, knowledge and empirical information into the assessment tools in order to reduce uh, uncertainties. And that's all from my side. Um, thank you very much. Thank you uh, again, uh, Sara, for giving me the opportunity to, to, to make this uh, presentation. And of course, to all the attendees that showed their interest on, on this topic. Ivan, thank you so much. Um, this is our first ever Wave Energy uh, webinar, and we're, we're glad to uh, be learning more. Um, just for everyone who's attending, Again, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can either send them into the chat or use the question and answer. Um, and you're free to chat and provide additional information in the chat. Just please keep it to the topic. Um, so we do already have several questions. Um, one is there are all of these variables in the model. Are they considering only the EU European Union environment and devices because the European Union, Latin America and US areas are very different? Mm, yes, uh, it is. Um, uh, yes, we have based this in the European legislation, as I said, the European uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, but uh, as you will probably see, for example, um, it considers 16 different types of pressures, which in fact we could consider that those are a way of classifying the pressures that could be produced by different human activities, as well as for the ecosystem elements. Uh, there, there are elements that are related to uh, species, mammals, birds, reptiles, uh, cephalops, fish, um, habitats, pelagic and benthic, and the, the rest of the ecosystem elements that are Mm, uh, seabed morphology or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is true that the framework is based on uh, the, uh, the definition of the European legislation, but at the same time, it's generic enough to be uh, applied uh, anywhere. I mean, it is covering all the ecosystem elements that uh, are present in, in, in in all uh, seas. So uh, it is generic enough and the nomenclature and the terminology, et cetera, uh, it's uh, easily understood by any manager or scientist, I think. Ivan, how easy or hard would it be for a new area to sort of change some of the weightings if say there was uh, indicators that there was greater danger or risk for marine mammals in a certain area than there was in the EU, in EU waters. Uh, how easy or hard would it be to alter the tool? Uh, excuse me, sorry, I have not understood the, the question, sorry. Uh, well, if, if you were going to be using uh, the tool in a new area, let's say in mm -hmm. Latin America, um, would they be able to, using science, uh, from there, would they be able to change the weightings to, if there were if, if there were signs that there was greater risk to say marine mammals in their mm. locality than there were? Yes, uh, it depends on the tool. I mean, if it is uh, for a uh, weaker tool, all the ecosystem elements uh, do have the same uh, weighting. So there, there are no differences. Uh, the weighting is based on the sensitivity to ecosystem elements uh, to pressures, okay? But uh, when uh, using the, the model, 
to produce the spatially explicit uh, suitability maps is true that uh, at the moment uh, our approach is based on the probability of presence of the uh, ecosystem elements. So for example, the distribution of mammals. So we have uh, adopted uh, general uh, maps of the potential distribution of uh, different species of uh, sea mammals. And uh, we combined that information and uh, we have calculated the ecological risks to that component based on that information. But uh, it's very broad. Uh, it is covering the full uh, European uh, seas. So um, yes, this is something that, uh, let's say, we should improve. But at the same time, there is not a high quality information uh, with this uh, full uh, geographical coverage. So what I mean is that if uh, there is a better resolution information, then the, uh, that information should be integrated into the model and should run the model again to get a higher uh, certainty or uh, reliability information, yes. Uh, what I saw is for the full, uh, it's an example, but it's for the full coastline of Spain and Portugal. And we are now producing a map for the whole European uh, Atlantic area. So it's quite difficult to find, um, let's say, good quality or information on the ecosystem elements. Um, yeah. But at the end, the, the tool what tries to do is to, to highlight certain areas that might present higher conflicts with other uses or higher risk. Mm, but of course, uh, when selecting an area, it requires a higher resolution analysis. Okay, thank you, Iban. And I think you started to address another question I had uh, too about um, different areas. Okay, another question that came in uh, from Nicholas, are other types of wave energy converters expected to be included in this tool in the future? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, considered three different devices. Uh, no, three different technologies. They are not devices, uh, but they are different uh, technologies. So uh, they are generic, very generic because uh, what we have uh, considered here are the three main um, mm, uh, technologies. No, One of them is the oscillating wave. The other one is the uh, wave surge converter and the, the wave turbine. Uh, for example, here where we are located, we are running now uh, one European project, research project in which uh, we are monitoring uh, the noise or the effects on the seafloor of uh, specific uh, devices. So yes, yes. Uh, I think that the, the framework that we are uh, proposing uh, could uh, in, be used to integrate as I said, empirical information. So, I mean, and this is a, a first stage, what we did. Uh, we didn't have uh, empirical information when we developed the, the tool. So in that case, we used the expert judgment and we have an assessment of the uncertainty uh, related to the, to the assessment that we are providing. But of course, as soon as we get more information from monitoring programs of, of the testing site that is located here in, in the Basque Country, we can integrate that information. So that would mean that we can integrate uh, the pressures produced by a specific uh, devices or a specific uh, designs. And at the same time, we should uh, think about how we could uh, integrate also an indicator and how integrating more uh, empirical information 
the reliability of the assessment could uh, could increase. No? So yes, this is also a thing that we should uh, integrate. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, question, and this is just coming from, uh, how many testing sites are there globally? You said there's well, one in Basque country. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just curious if you had an idea about that. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I know that there is another in, known in Scotland, another one in Peniche in Portugal. That's, those are the ones that I know because we are running projects with them. But and I know that uh, there are more in the US, but uh, I'm not aware of them. But th there are platforms eh, in, from, in which you can check that. Uh, for example, Tetis, T-E-T-H-Y. And uh, through that uh, web page, there is a, it's a very big uh, platform with a lot of information. And probably uh, if you are interested, you can get access there to the, to the testing sites and a, a lot of other information in relation to the environmental aspects of uh, renewable energy in general. Okay, thank you. And one of our... Um attendees that are they're sending some information about some uh, one in Hawaii, the US Navy wave energy test site in Kaneohe, Hawaii, a Tethys website, which I suspect is in the Pacific Northwest of the US. Uh, and then one in Haifa, Israel, with devices from a Swedish company. So anyway, there's, there's a number that people are posting in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, there was a question, have you considered the ecological impacts of non-power grid applications such as desalinization? So I'm not sure that, that sounds like it would be a completely different tool. Mm -hmm. Hi, that's also a very good um, question. Not, <laughs> not for now, um, but uh, we are intending to do that. Uh, why? And this is why we used this uh, framework of the 16 different pressures. If you remember, when I showed this, uh, the, the radar plots, for example, I mentioned that, for example, uh, there was a pressure that was not likely to happen, which was, for example, the input of organic matter, for example. So that pressure is not expected to be produced by wave energy devices, but it is considered uh, within our assessment. So the value is zero, but we have considered uh, uh, that pressure in our framework or in our uh, scheme. So that means that uh, this framework is generic enough to include different assessments of different pressures produced by different activities, okay? So that means that, uh, for example, another interesting point here is not for wave energy converters at this stage, but for example, for wind farms, let's say. An important thing is that uh, renewable energy is going to be, let's say, in, in not in all places around the world, but in most cases, it's going to be a new activity. Being a new activity, it's, it's going to produce uh, new pressures, but those pressures, in certain cases, will be combined with other existing pressures, okay? So the idea is to analyze not only the pressures produced by renewables, but to assess how the new pressures produced by renewable energy are going to be combined or are going to, um, let's say, are going to put additional pressures to the marine environment. So uh, because of that, we adopted this general framework of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, but with the idea of collecting uh, different pressures and ecosystem elements produced by different uh, uh, maritime activities and to produce models that can combine all those pressures into one model. So we could see which is the combined pressures or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, and, 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 and yes, that's the, uh, the, the, the answer, yes. 
Okay, thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, if anybody has any other questions, I haven't seen anything that's actually, there's been some good chats. Oh, wait, okay, we do have a question that came in. It says, great framework. Do you intend to include existing environmental studies done in the US to this tool? Um, environmental studies, uh, but are you referring to the WEC ERA tool? Uh I suspect from testing sites in the U.S. and ah, people have mentioned sites. a couple off the coast of uh, yes. Oregon. And... <laughs> it would be great. Yes, because I, I, it's referring to the to what I was saying to, to the transfer transfer value. You know? So at the end, if there is uh, one specific device uh, that we are monitoring here in the Basque Country, and uh, there are other technologies that are being tested in uh, the US and probably they are monitored uh, using similar protocols, of course, uh, that would be great. If we could uh, integrate that information, uh, it, it would be uh, very relevant because one of the uh, one of the the things that I was uh, highlighting is that the transfer value, you know, and accessibility to to data. Because at the end, if in one testing site they are monitoring this information for that specific uh, device, I mean, if there is going to be uh, a, a plan to construct uh, a way farm in 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 another place. Uh, with the same uh, device, of course, of that knowledge already available and accessible for the users, it's very val valuable. Uh, yes, <laughs> we have to check how we could uh, do that, or any any way of uh, yeah, or, or or any kind of or, or or way of collaboration with other institutions of, uh, also because at the end integrating all this information is it also requires a lot of work mm, uh, yes i mean potentially we, we would be interested and uh, and yes i think that uh, it would improve the the tool uh, the quality of the tool and its usefulness yes okay thank you ivan and if anybody has any of those connections or works in those, uh, Yvonne's email is there. Um, well, we don't have any more questions, but um, this was fascinating. This is a, a great tool um, as we hopefully move uh, towards decarbonizing our, our energy sources. And so this, this seems like a, it's going to be incredibly invaluable. Um, and we thank everyone who was able to attend. We thank Yvonne for presenting and um, we look forward to uh, hearing about the, the VAPM tool in the future. So thank you everyone for attending today and thank you even for presenting. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity and thank you to the attendees and uh, for these uh, questions and the nice discussion, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>